Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kathleen Coleman Birch and I'm the communications manager here at the Marinole Office for Global Concerns. My colleague Susan Gunn and I are coming to you today from our respective homes in Washington, DC. Even while working from home during a pandemic, we from the Office for Global Concerns continue to represent the three branches of the Marinol mission, the sisters, the fathers and brothers, and the lay missioners. And we work closely with the Marinol affiliates. Our job is to bring the Marinol mission experience to important debates about public policy at the UN on Capitol Hill and to the World Bank, IMF, and the corporate world. And our mission is to promote peace, social justice, and integrity of creation. We do this through education, advocacy, and action. And today we offer some education. Our director, Susan Gunn, will talk with us about food security and the need to build sustainable food systems. So while Susan talks to us, I invite you all to type questions for her in the Zoom Q&A or in the chat on YouTube. And with that, I turn it over to you, Susan. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm so glad to be here today with all of you. I've prepared a slideshow so we can have a short but deep dive into food security. So just give me a second to share my screen. Okay, today I'm here to talk about food security, building a sustainable system, which implies what we have now for a global food system is not sustainable. And what we realized during the pandemic is that it's not working for more and more people. Like all of the webinars in our series, this one's based on a two page written brief that you can find on our website, www.marinologc.org. And there's also a whole page of further resources on food security. So if you hear me say something that you wanna learn more about, just go to our website, open the link to the election briefs project and scroll down to food security. You'll notice that each of the briefs uses the popular methodology, see, judge, act. So first in the C section, that's where we study the facts and try to understand what's happening. And then in the judge section, we judge the issue according to what our faith has to tell us. And then in the act section, that's where we learn how we can take action as we're called as Christians and as Catholics and as responsible citizens. So let's kick off the C section to see what's happening in our food systems today. Well, in just a matter of months, the coronavirus shut down more than half of the world. Images of panic buying, empty grocery shelves, and miles long lines at food banks have suddenly reminded us how important food systems are in our lives and how unbalanced they've become. Disruptions due to outbreaks of the illness and restrictions and lockdowns run the gamut from crops going unharvested by migrant workers unable to reach their jobs, to shipping problems, to farm families selling livestock and equipment to survive. Even before the pandemic, agricultural industries were struggling with natural disasters such as typhoons and drought, and diseases and pests such as the massive locust swarms in East Africa. Add in sickness and lockdowns due to COVID-19, and we see the need to build food systems that can manage multiple risks at once. So this is why by July, the International Monetary Fund said 2020 will be a year of reckoning for the world's food systems. Let's look closer at our terms. The UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, known as the FAO, leads international efforts to end hunger and improve nutrition and food security. So we look to the FAO to give us definitions and measurements. What is food insecurity? A person is food insecure when they lack regular access to enough safe and nutritious food for normal growth and development and an active and healthy life. This could be because of the food not being available or a lack of resources to obtain food. Food insecurity can be experienced at different levels of severity from mild to moderate to severe. The FAO measures food insecurity and estimates that the combination of moderate and severe levels of food insecurity brings the total to about 2 billion people. That's 26.4% of the world population. And what is hunger? Well, we all know 
that it's that uncomfortable or painful physical sensation caused by insufficient consumption of calories. It becomes chronic when the person doesn't consume a sufficient amount of calories on a regular basis to lead a normal, active, and healthy life. Today, the FAO estimates that almost 820 million people are going hungry, a number that has been slowly increasing for the past several years, and they often refer to hunger as undernourishment. Let's look closer at how the global food system is designed. The current global food supply chain is highly centralized and operating on a just-in-time supply basis. This makes it prone to falter in the face of shocks. For example, a dozen or so big exporters, including the United States, India, Russia, and Vietnam, dominate the market for the staple grains of wheat and rice. Moving food around the world is also highly concentrated. In about a half a dozen trading firms such as Cargill from Minnesota and Kafko from Beijing. In addition to the food supply chain being highly centralized, agriculture is heavily affected by the timing of the lockdown because of the strict planting and harvesting calendar. If the planting season is missed, there will be no crop for the season or for the entire year. Many countries and regions such as China, North America, and Europe faced labor shortages and supply chain disruptions for their spring planting. In many other parts of the world, such as in India and other South Asian countries, spring was also the harvest time for winter crops such as wheat, potato, cotton, and many other fruits and vegetables. Harvesting all kinds of crops has been disrupted by lockdowns. The recent nationwide lockdown in Thailand witnessed the exodus of tens of thousands of migrant workers from Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos. The planting of rice, corn, and sugarcane in Thailand faced serious consequences when many migrant workers didn't return to work in May. So as the industry has globalized, it has grown more concentrated and creating bottlenecks. The highly centralized food supply chain and government intervention, often in the form of tariffs, along with the harshness of climate change and unpredictable fluctuations of commodity markets, mean that the system is finely tuned and can misfire with devastating consequences. For example, not that long ago in 2007 and 8, bad harvests and high energy costs pushed up food prices, and this led governments to panic about shortages and ban exports, causing more anxiety and even higher prices. The result was a wave of riots and distress in countries around the world. Let's look at what's happening now with restrictions on movement and trade during the pandemic. People can't access markets, uh, threatening both their lives and livelihood. In developing countries, the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Food Program expect that a hunger pandemic and a doubling of people starving may soon eclipse the coronavirus unless action is taken. The UN says 265 million people could face starvation by the end of 2020. We were aware of the fault lines in the global food system before COVID-19 hit in early 2020. According to the FAO annual report called State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, the number of people going hungry has been rising. And now, as progress in fighting hunger stalls, the COVID-19 pandemic is intensifying the vulnerabilities of global food systems. And while it's too early to assess the full impact of the lockdowns and other containment measures, the FAO forecasts that the number of undernourished people will increase by up to 132 million in this year, while the number of acutely malnourished children will rise by 6.7 million worldwide due to the pandemic. If recent trends continue, the zero hunger target of the UN Sustainable Development Goals will not be achieved by 2030. Where are people struggling with hunger? They are everywhere, in your community and mine. The hungry are most numerous in Asia, but expanding fastest in Africa. Hunger is also slowly rising in Latin America and the Caribbean, while Western Asia shows a continuous increase since 2010, with more than 12% of the population undernourished today. High costs and low affordability also mean that billions cannot eat healthy or nutritious food. This year, the UN report presents evidence that a healthy diet costs far more than the $1.90 a day that is the international poverty threshold. 
a staggering 3 billion people or more cannot afford a healthy diet. In Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia, this is the case for 57% of the population, though no region, including North America and Europe, is spared. Partly as a result, the race to end malnutrition appears compromised. At the same time, 600 million people were characterized as obese and 2 billion overweight because of imbalanced diets, which were also associated with obesity, diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular diseases that compromise immune health. Today, immunodepressed and malnourished people worldwide are suffering disproportionately the consequences of COVID-19. The limitations of the food system go beyond failing to feed the world well to failing to care for the environment. Food produced through the overuse of chemicals in monoculture cropping systems and intensive animal farming on land and at sea degrades natural resources faster than they can reproduce and causes a quarter of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions, with livestock responsible for about half of that. According to the FAO, industrial animal farming operations that rear large numbers of animals in confined spaces breed lethal viruses like the 2009 swine flu and spread antibiotic-resistant superbugs because of the overuse of antibiotics to promote their growth and prevent infections. At the same time, our uncontrolled disturbance of pristine habitats to farm and to hunt has allowed deadly pathogens like SARS, HIV, Ebola to jump species infecting ours. Now, we can't talk about food and food systems without talking about farms and smallholder farmers. About 80% of the world's poorest and most food insecure people live in remote rural areas, many working in small scale agriculture. There are more than 570 million farms worldwide, most of which are small and family operated. Small farms operate about 12% of the world's agricultural land and family farms about 75%. Since 1960, the size of the average farm has decreased in most low and lower middle income countries, while average farm sizes have increased in some upper middle income countries and nearly all high income countries. So who are smallholder farmers? There are around 500 million smallholder farmers in the world, and they produce up to 80% of the food consumed in Africa and Asia. They are net buyers of food and they are really very vulnerable to food price increases and spikes. As a group, they are among the poorest and most marginalized in the world. They are also stewards of increasingly scarce natural resources and on the front line of dealing with the impacts of climate change. Smallholder farmers therefore play a critical role in addressing the challenges of food security, poverty, and climate change. Africa's smallholder farmers face many challenges, preventing them from scaling up their participation in markets, including uh, insecure rights to land and natural resources, lack of access to quality inputs and financial services, inadequate support from research and extension services, high transportation costs uh, caused by poor rural infrastructure. Smallholder farmers have little say in policy decisions that impact their lives or in the design of research agendas. In addition, domestic and international markets for agricultural produce are changing rapidly and dramatically with small producers finding it increasingly hard to participate in these markets. Challenges are even greater for women farmers, who constitute the majority of farmers in Africa. International efforts to support smallholder farmers tend to follow a conventional approach to boosting productivity, with much of the emphasis on commercializing agriculture, using modern inputs, and encouraging integration of smallholders into agricultural value chains, particularly those produced for export markets. However, evidence suggests that only a small group of wealthier and better connected smallholders are currently likely to be able to benefit from opportunities created this way. For the majority of small scale farmers, and particularly those who are more marginalized, and that is women farmers, different forms of support are needed to facilitate their greater participation in markets as a means of increasing food security at the national and household level. There are proven ways to address challenges that smallholder women farmers in Africa face. 
first, involve women in the sale of produce at market, giving them more financial independence. Next, set up women's savings and loans groups. Also run training programs at times when women can attend and provide childcare. And also design projects that women can run from their homes, such as beekeeping and textile weaving. Married Omissioners offers some great and relevant examples of how we can build sustainable food systems, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. In Kenya, Married Ol Father Lance Nado organizes training for small-scale farmers with new seeds on some plots of land that he's secured. Also, Married Ol Sister Patricia Ryan and indigenous farmers in Puno, Peru, uh, recently worked with the local church officials to write to the government after the national state of emergency set mandatory social distance guidelines that made it impossible for them to work in groups to plant and harvest their crops. Among the Marino Lay missioners, Sammy Scott runs a food security program with chickens in Haiti. In El Salvador, Peg Vamosi teaches sustainable agricultural approaches. And in Kenya, Rich Taro leads an emergency food response at his education ministry. All of these local community focused projects are responding as each new challenge arises with COVID-19. You can find links to articles and videos with each of these missioners on our resource page. The faithful witness of Marino missioners is a nice segue to the second step in our method, which is the judge section. This is where we ask, how does our faith inform our thinking about this issue? The issue of food security is one of the urgent concerns of the Catholic Church. When food is not made available to all people, full and integral human development is undermined. To be food insecure is to lose human dignity and to experience a threat to life itself. Uh, we can look to scripture and find teaching in Proverbs 22 about sharing your food and you will be blessed. And in Isaiah 58, share your food and your light will fill the darkness of this world. And I think we all remember uh, Jesus teaching in Matthew 25 about our care for the least of these. And he said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. We also can look to church tradition and Catholic social teaching. In his encyclical Caritas and Veritate, Pope Benedict affirmed that a way to eliminate the structural causes of food insecurity uh, is to promote agricultural development through investments in rural infrastructure, irrigation, transportation, organizing markets, uh, training and sharing techniques among farmers. And more recently, Pope Francis reminds us that realizing the fundamental human right to adequate food is not only an economic and technical matter, but also and principally an ethical and anthropological one. Um, in one of his uh, messages for World Food Day, which is celebrated each year on October 16th, Francis said states bear the obligation to create favorable conditions for food security, to respect the person and his or her way of using the necessary resources to ensure the safety and uh, quantity of food. If we want systems to ensure the right to adequate food for everyone, especially the most disadvantaged people, Sound policies and effective measures to prevent food losses are also required. But why is the present food system so ineffective? Guided by the vision of Catholic social teaching, we realize that systemic problem of food insecurity is the consequence of a system centered on the market rather than on the human person. In his apostolic exhortation, The Joy of the Gospel, Pope Francis said no to the economy of exclusion and inequality that kills human beings and the environment. He rejected trickle-down theories that promise greater justice and inclusiveness through economic growth and free markets. He asked all of us, can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? In his encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis reminds us that a correct reading of the biblical text reveals an invitation to till and keep the garden of the world, to be its stewards and guardians. And this is from Genesis. While tilling refers to cultivating and working, 
Keeping means caring, protecting, overseeing, preserving. The situation demands that we adopt new patterns of production and consumption. The fruits of the earth are meant to benefit everyone. To fulfill this vision, we need a social perspective, which takes into account the fundamental rights of the poor and underprivileged. Laudato C. also speaks about promoting an economy which favors productive diversity and values small-scale food production systems, which feed the greater part of the world. In many cases, small-scale producers are forced to sell their land or abandon their traditional crops. Civil authorities have the right and the duty to adopt measures in support of small-scale producers and differentiated production. It's also essential that food systems integrate the fundamental value of human work. To ensure that the fruits of human work don't get lost is a matter of justice. National and local policies and measures should encourage forms of cooperation and community organizations. That brings us to the final action section of our See Judge Act method. This is where we learn what actions we can take to build sustainable food systems. One of the first actions you can take is to celebrate World Food Day on October 16th. Pope Francis will release a message for the day and other organizations like the FAO, the World Food Program, Bread for the World, and probably your local food bank will share videos, stories, and more education about ways you can support food security in your community, country, and the world. Healing the world from COVID-19 is an opportunity to build something better. The American author Michael Pollan offers some ideas on what we each can do to build a sustainable food system. Eat more plants, cut down on waste, buy local, learn about sustainability, volunteer with local projects, and grow some of your own food. Pope Francis has been talking about this opportunity to build something better during his Wednesday general audience talks available online, and we expect it to be a big focus of his new encyclical due out around October 4th. Based on what I've covered in the C section and in the judge section, I ask you to reach out to political candidates and ask them about adopting four broad priorities for food security. The first priority is more resilient food supply chains. We need policies that empower small producers and retailers and mainstream them in the food systems. The second priority is healthy diets, curbing the overconsumption of animal and high processed foods in wealthier countries and improving access to good nutrition in poorer ones can improve well-being and land use efficiency, make healthy foods more affordable globally and slash carbon emissions. Retargeting agricultural subsidies towards healthy foods, taxing unhealthy foods and allying procurement practices, education programs and healthcare systems towards better diets can go a long way in achieving this. In turn, this can reduce healthcare costs globally, reduce inequalities and help us weather the next pandemic with healthier people. The third priority is regenerative farming. A shift towards sustainable and regenerative land and ocean farming connected to strong local and regional food systems can heal our soil, air and water, boosting economic resilience and local jobs. The fourth priority is conservation. Breeding fewer animals to accommodate a shift towards a more plant-based diet in wealthier countries is key to saving pristine ecosystems. At the same time, conservation efforts in line with recent proposals by the UN Environment Assembly for a global framework to protect the Earth's plant and wildlife, together with bold measures to eradicate the trade of wild animals, are central to restoring biodiversity, uh, boosting carbon sequestration, and uh, lower the risk of future pandemics. Okay, now is really the time to get involved. Please reach out to campaigns and let them know you care about these issues and find out where the candidates stand. I know that neither political party is quite as visionary as the church or the UN in thinking about building a more sustainable, productive and resilient global food system. 
they are generally still operating out of a highly centralized, just-in-time supply chain mindset. But that doesn't mean you can't vote for candidates whose policies would move us closer to a more sustainable food system. In each part of the election, discern which candidates would promote multilateralism and international cooperation to strategically focus resources and target investments. Also, which candidate supports the United States taking on international leadership and collaboration? And discern which candidate welcomes all participants, especially women and small-scale producers, and is open to innovation and new technologies. Finally, I urge you to make a plan to vote. Confirm that you are registered, vote early, and vote for sustainable food security. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, you raised some excellent points about church teaching and the current state of food systems and what people of faith can do to advocate for change. Um, and now I have a couple of questions lined up for you. Um, the first one is, how can global cooperation lead to more resilient local food systems? That is a great question. Um, you know, COVID-19 has shown us that we need strong local food systems to survive in a world that has global pandemics. And it's going to take global cooperation to make it resilient and sustainable. And there are three uh, particular challenges that come to mind. And the first challenge is ensuring food security. Getting food to customers uh, requires well-functioning supply chains and a social safety net. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed those weaknesses in our highly centralized system and the need to make local food systems stronger. Um, in some places, that means investing in and protecting uh, smallholder farmers. In other places, it means tackling poverty. And in even other places, it means ending violent conflicts. A, a second challenge uh, is protecting jobs. So helping uh, smallholder farmers and everyone else along the supply chain to be flexible in our rapidly changing markets. That requires good policies and coordinated support. So training, technical assistance, subsidies, uh, maybe even waiving license requirements at uh, emergency times, things like that. Um, and then the third challenge uh, is protecting the environment. So the global food system stresses the environment, both at the local level, if you can think of um, water pollution from excessive fertilizer use, and at the global level, uh, contributing to greenhouse gases and climate change overall. Agriculture also accounts for the vast majority of um, global water use. Um, and it can be a threat to biodiversity. Um, it's a leading driver of deforestation. So just look at the Amazon and where trees are cut down to make room for cattle that's raised for beef, which is sold around the world in the United States and in China are the big, big markets. Um, so environmental sustainability is important in its own right. But it's also important for farmers in the long term that these are people who get hit by climate shocks and disasters like drought and flooding. So these are big challenges and they all need global cooperation. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, a second question here is how does international food aid affect local food systems and what does the example um, of the situation with rice in Haiti teach us? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a big one. So we're talking about the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. So one of the most important consequences from food aid is the effect on food prices locally. So the evidence shows that food prices almost invariably fall in local markets immediately after food aid arrives. And in poorly functioning markets that are separated from uh, uh, big commercial channels like Haiti after the 2010 earthquake, price drops can be dramatic and they can persist. So this decreases profits for local farmers, 
um, limits their ability to pay off debts, uh, handicaps them from investing and improving their business. And after the earthquake in Haiti and food aid poured in to feed 3 million people, um, the big donation of, of rice from the US, well, that's a product that's grown in Haiti. So rice farmers there said that the rice donations produced a glut that pushed prices down. So if a Haitian farmer can't sell his rice, he won't have money to buy seeds for the next season. And because he supplies other neighbors with seeds, their next season will be affected too. So the entire supply chain can be affected from the farmer to the wholesaler to merchants selling rice in the market. And many of them say uh, business uh, is down because people receiving free rice from donors aren't buying local. So food is one of the most urgent needs in a crisis, but this case illustrates that when donors bring in food, those who make a living growing and selling it suffer. So mm. one big lesson from Haiti is the need for donors to buy locally when possible. But U.S. food aid was consistently almost entirely American grain because we were using food aid programs to get rid of our surplus. So another lesson is not to put our needs first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to report that the United States joined the World Food Program Local and Regional Procurement of Food Aid Program. Um, so you can find this mentioned in the Farm Bill. Um, a third lesson is for donors to create jobs uh, so Haitians have money to buy their own food. And those jobs could be um, infrastructure improvements and other community projects that help farmers grow food for the local market. Thank you. You give us a lot to think about with that. Um, so we are almost out of time, but really quickly, I want to ask you, can you say one thing that's giving you hope in this time? Um, it's a very difficult time. Um, and the numbers are scary uh, for the number of people who are food insecure. Uh, but I do see hope. Um, you know, people's awareness about the issue of um, our food, where it comes from, the care for the planet um, and care for each other, um, this gives me hope. Um, you know, if you think of uh, what one of the most popular internships among college students is today, is working on an organic farm. Now, most won't stick with farming as a career, but many of them will emerge from the experience with a sharper appreciation for what it takes to be a farmer um, and where our food comes from, and maybe a greater willingness to um, pay a fair price for the important work that farmers do and to adopt uh, appropriate healing policies. And, and finally, Pope Francis gives me hope. You know, I agree with him uh, when he says healing the world is an opportunity to build something better. Recovery from COVID-19 is a time of great stress, but it's also a time when lots of people are ready for courageous leaps forward in progress. So I encourage everybody to listen to the Pope's Wednesday general audience talks online and to read the new encyclical that is due out next week. Thanks so much, Susan. So it looks like that is all the time for today. Um, I want to say thank you again to Susan for this excellent presentation and to all of you for joining us. We hope this webinar and the two-pager on food security on our website empowers all of us to contribute to important conversations in this election year. This is the last webinar in our 2020 election series. Um, and you can find all eight two-page briefs and corresponding 30-minute webinars on our website, right on the front page. Thanks to those who've joined us throughout the entire series, and we hope it has been helpful for your discernment regarding the elections. Now, go vote. Thanks, and peace to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.